DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Michael Novak, who is a distinguished visiting professor at Ave Maria University in Florida. After 32 years in the chair in religion and public policy at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., he was the 1994 recipient of the Templeton Prize and was on three occasions U.S. Ambassador under Ronald Reagan. With Michael Novak, we go inside the pages of Social Justice Isn't What You Think It Is, published by Encounter Books. What is social justice? For Frederick Hayek, it was a mirage, a meaningless, ideological, incoherent, vacuous cliché. He believed the term should be avoided, abandoned, and allowed to die a natural death. For its proponents, social justice is a catch-all term that can be used to justify any progressive-sounding government program. It endures because it venerates its champions and brands its opponents as supporters of social injustice, and thus as enemies of humankind. As an ideological marker, social justice always works best when it is not too sharply defined. In Social Justice Isn't What You Think It Is, Michael Novak and Paul Adams seek to clarify the true meaning of social justice and to rescue it from its ideological captors. In examining figures ranging from Antonio Rosamini, Abraham Lincoln, and Frederick Hayek, to Popes Leo XIII, John Paul II, and Francis, the authors reveal that social justice is not a synonym for progressive government, as we have come to believe. Rather, it is a virtue, rooted in Catholic social teaching and developed as the alternative to the unchecked power of the state. Almost all social workers set themselves as progressives, not conservatives. Yet many of their best practices aim to empower families and local governments. They stress not individual or state, but the vast social space between them. Left and right surprisingly meet. In this surprising reintroduction of its original intent, social justice represents an immensely powerful virtue for nurturing personal responsibility and building the human communities that can encounter the widespread surrender to an ever-growing state. We now begin part one of our discussion with Michael Novak. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, I'm really happy to be with you again. Social justice isn't what you think it is. I, the thing I love about this book is that most of us truly don't understand even what the term means, really. It's just one of those terms that never get defined. Everybody uses them. Father Shaw points out that values is another term like that. What it really means is that... Uh, you don't have any values. Whatever you happen to like, that's your value. So what the heck is that? Anyway, it's one of those terms that uh, are sort of empty until you think them through. Well, it, the term social justice has almost become a word that has a connotation for some who may consider themselves on the right of political issues as some type of a really ugly term. And that, you know, you have to beware of social justice. Mm-hmm. And on the left, it, it's almost like a catch-all. And yet, we really don't understand at, at its heart what true Catholic social teaching, as it were, truly is. And I think you helped define that. No, that's for sure. My, my friend, Paul Adams and colleague, who helped write the book, is really responsible for it because... He's an emeritus professor of social work. He's Great Britain born, but worked all across the United States, ending up at Hawaii. And um, he says in the field, his field, social work, the number one value is 
social justice. But nobody questions what it means. It's just taken for granted. And yet he points out that the best practices of social work down the last 50 years have come out more and more to a spot where there's no definition of it. But when he took my class on Catholic social thought and this is the justice on social justice, he said, well, this is the theory for which social work is now the practice. One one theme would give you an idea. Social workers have discovered that if you do everything for the poor, well, when you leave, they don't know how to do it for themselves, and you left them just as bad off. So what you what the social worker has to recognize is that I don't have all the answers. I have to work with this other person and let this other person come to decisions about what to do. And I can guide, I can coach, whatever. But unless that other person decides to act in a, in a different way, in a, in a way that's suitable to him or her, nothing's going to be left behind. So what what that put that into theory, it means you have to teach other people good habits, better habits than they have, habits that enable them to solve problems for themselves. And if you transfer those habits, you have, you have enough insight as a trained social worker to see what needs to be done, what has worked elsewhere. And if you can help them to see that and help them to adapt that as a policy of their own habits, uh, boy, you leave behind a foundation that they can work on themselves and get better at. So that, in an essence, that's what Paul and I think that social justice is. It's a virtue or a set of virtues acquired by individuals that make them social animals, make them good at forming associations and running things for themselves without turning to the state. Now, nothing wrong with turning to the state at certain points and for certain needs, but you know, even to get to that point, people on the left who promote the state and state activities have to organize themselves as activists and form a movement to get government to do this or that. So the practice of social justice, I'm going on too long here, but the practice of social justice is both on the left and on the right. They have different visions about where to go and what the ends are, but they both need to practice the individual virtue of association, form associations, work together with others, um, build up a consensus, and to move forward. In some cases, have we been guilty of to oversimplify it, of, of the tail wagging the dog, where we we try to, we, we insist on reforming big, large systems as opposed to changing the hearts of the individual. Absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a, a really mythic structure that the state knows how to solve these problems. And if we turn it over to the state, we don't have to be personally involved anymore. And it will, but just look at them. Look what our government did. What turned me in a more conservative direction is I was very much on the left when I was younger. But most of the pro- worked hard for the war in poverty and other things when they were enacted didn't turn out the way I supposed. I never guessed that ten years after the war on poverty was en- enacted, there would be a six hundred percent increase in violent crime, in poor areas especially. Mm -hmm. I never thought of that. You know, I never imagined that the government would spend $70 billion on welfare in the next 40 years uh, and still would have a huge percentage of the population in poverty, something like 15% now almost. Um, Heck, if the government had just given money to every poor family $7,000 a year on average, that's what they need to get out of poverty. You know, almost every family, every family that works Mm -hmm. has some income. And even people on welfare, they have some income. And if you add to that uh, a little bit of a, you know, hand up and multiply it by the number of families who need it, $7,000, it's not that much. And uh, we could have, we could have, ended poverty simply by giving money to people. Instead, we built a big governmental agency that, as that Tom Sowell, the economist, pointed out, is um, it's like uh, feeding the 
swallows by feeding the horses. Mm -hmm. You feed the big government machinery, and then what's left over goes for the swallows. It's a very inefficient way. Government is not made to do work like that. Human beings with their loving hearts are made to do work like that. And the government may need to help out, but you can't let the government help out too much or it'll start dictating terms, like it did for Catholic charities in mm -hmm. regard to adoptions. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's a, you know, it's a tricky notion and a very important notion, a very, very central notion to our way of life, very crucial to the free society. And it, it helps to be clear about it. Do we make a mistake in not appreciating uh, the dynamic structures that have developed in history, especially in the last 150, 200 years, that the world has changed significantly, even as how the gospel was proclaimed and lived out prior to the last couple centuries? Yeah, my, I always think of it this way. Um, my grandparents came from... Um, Slovakia, a little country right at the center of Europe, up in the mountains, just beyond Switzerland, and in Central Europe, the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic. Well, they were they were peasants for serfs, really. You know, from about the sixty no, from earlier than that, um, until they came to America. On their passports, it said they were subjects of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the uh, empire decided how much of their, or their particular boss did. They, you know, they all worked. They were indentured to certain lords and counts and dukes. And the, the top man decided how much of their crop they had to deliver to him and how much they could keep for themselves. Um, they weren't allowed to... to hold private property as near as I could determine when, on my trips over there until about 1926. Um, they were treated like property of the of the owner of the castle. Mm -hmm. I know exactly the castle in Slovakia that my family worked for. Mm -hmm. And um, their main duties as good Christians and good human beings could be summarized in three terms. Pray, pay, and obey. And if they did those th three things, they were good subjects and good Christians. Um, but when they came to America, they were now not subjects anymore. They were sovereigns. They elected, hired, in effect, their political leaders. And if they wanted a change, they had to agitate for it and work for it. And in many sorts of things, they had to provide for themselves. For example old age assistance and insurance for a man who got hurt in the mill or as bricklayers from carrying too many bricks or whatever, carrying too many shingles up to a roof and hurt their backs. Mm -hmm. People like this would be disabled and help was needed for the family. So they, the Slovaks in America and the Irish and the Germans and others formed their service societies, insurance societies to take care of their own. Well, as people began to move more, I'm telling too long a story here. No, not at all. Uh, we have state institutions. That's that's sure. I'm not opposed to those, and I don't think they're opposed to social justice. But if they get too big and too demanding, they are. They take command, and they don't allow the virtues and the beliefs um, and habits of people to flourish. And one other thing, in in the 1800s. Millions of people began fleeing from the countryside to the cities. That's what made my grandparents move. And um, that's what made uh, Leo the 13th in the um, rare and of arms say, hey, new things are happening. Uh, we need to preach the Gospels in a new way because the Gospels are filled with agricultural stories sheep and goats and figs and weeds and tares and wheat and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, But people no longer live in agricultural societies. Ninety percent of them did. Now the countryside is emptying out and people are living in cities. Families don't work together from dawn until dusk. They work separately in different places. And it was greatly weakening the family. Um, and if you lose the sense of family, it makes it almost impossible to make sense 
of God the Father, is the Holy Family, how the infant, and how all these things relate together. So if we want to present Catholic faith, we have to look at a new social order and um, figure out how to present the Catholic faith in new terms because the old agrarian culture is broken down and we're moving into an urban culture. So that was the purpose of calling Catholic social thought into being was to save the family and um, to learn new habits and to learn new way of speaking about new virtues that people needed in the new circumstances. Um, so, and then one other thing he noticed was the growing power of the state under new doctrines and ideologies of socialism and communism. Um, the state was taking more and more charge of everything. Abolish private property so the church could no longer have its own funding and its own printing presses um, in order to, to get out the work, to print Bibles, to print out the catechisms and the teachings of the bishops and so forth. Um, and uh, so Leo XIII wrote 13 reasons why socialism is bound to fail, why it can't work, why it's futile. And why it's evil. And I had occasion after 1989, and the wall came down, the Berlin Wall came down, to spend a good bit of time in Central Europe. And I, I had discussions with intellectuals and professors and journalists in uh, uh, Slovakia and the Czech Republic and Poland. And um, <laughs> they were reading you know, the 13th, going through the 13 reasons. They, that's exactly what happened. He nailed it, and uh, that's why it didn't work, mm -hmm. and that's why it did so many evils. Well, so he wanted to present that. He wanted a new way of practicing the social virtues, not through the state, because he saw its potential destructiveness, along with some good it could do, and he, um, he therefore called into being an alternative. He was called the Pope of Associations. And he believed humans have a tremendous amount of social power by themselves. They can form international associations like the Red Cross and a thousand other ones. Um, people in America, a lot of Christian churches are gathering small donations and bundling them into little capital gifts to make microloans to parishes overseas, to poor areas overseas, so people can start their own small businesses can have enough money to buy fertilizer to grow better rice or better flower crops, which they can then sell in the city and um, and become self-subsistent. And um, uh, there are all kinds of international organizations that depend on private funding. And then you can also put up a new playground in your school. Where I know towns in Poland where some of my students are, they called into being new wells, dug new wells after a couple hundred years in their villages and helped the villagers to organize to do this or to call on the government to come and pave the, the road through the village so it wasn't all muddy and gradually built up city streets too that were paved. And um, You know, I mean, there's, the, the power of individuals associating themselves together is vast. Most of the colleges and universities in the United States were built by private funds until the state university started rather late in history. Um, and um, uh, no, I'm going on too long, but this is what the other 13 saw and, and tried to encourage into being. He didn't call it social justice. He hadn't reached that term yet. He hesitated between social charity and social justice. And I'm not going to present the argument on that right here, but Paul mm -hmm. Adams does in the book. And um, in a way, very suited to practical people like social workers. Um, I'm sorry, I'm blabbering on, but I think our book brings a theory to practice with no equal uh, in the field. Oh, I would agree with that. I, everything that I have read on the subject prior to this has almost seemed as though it was more of a, I hate to characterize them as sound bites, but it was a more of a simplification 
of a subject that I'm not trying to say it's so deep that we can't understand it, but maybe it's it can transcend our understanding in a way that if, if we just go back to a fundamental principle, and I think, as you've said, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and as you wrote about him and have described him, he's trying to help us remember the dignity of the human individual. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We cover that dignity, which modern science society seems intent on obliterating, to really take value and purpose out of the individual person. You know, um, on sex education, just to name one thing, if you suggest that there should be abstinence, that people need to gain self-control and self-mastery, boy, you can get made fun of pretty quickly today. Mm -hmm. Uh, On the contrary, the modern theme is self-expression, do it. Well, there's such a difference in the outcomes of the different courses of action. And um, so Leo the Thirteenth is calling people back to a sense, human beings, human persons, back to a sense of their own capacities for self-control and self-mastery and the learning of a whole different variety of virtues so that they live more fruitful lives. You have It's an inner battle, first of all. Each person has to struggle in an inner battle to make himself a better person and a better social person, better able to work with others, be able to take responsibility together for your own neighborhood, your own state, your own city, whatever. And um, uh, these things are not easily done by social science. These have to be done by persons committed to changing themselves. It's not complicated, but in one way it's overlooked almost everywhere. And it's a point of Catholic social theory to keep reminding people of that world of virtue that lies behind every success in the moral sphere. Well, and at the very, very heart of it, the the central glue, the the building block of it all, and correct me if you, if you feel I'm oversimplifying it even more, it's how you love and yep. love one another. It, but that happens on the individual level. It doesn't. A government can't love you. Yeah, that's um, that's why Leo XIII hesitated about calling it social charity, because he it comes from the creative impulse of love to make society better for the sake of persons. Begin with persons you know. Charity begins at home. Begin with your own neighborhood. And there's so many things that could be done to make life better. In my wife's uh, little town in Iowa, um, they created a wellness center, a swimming pool that could be used year-round because you know, winters in Iowa can be pretty fierce. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it just to help the conditioning of children and adults, and it's not forcing things on anybody. And then they have exercise rooms and things like that. So it's just to improve the health of the little city. It's you know, 2,000 people. It's not real small, but it's not very big either. And um, it took a lot of fundraising to do that and to get it done. But it's vastly improved the lives, even the fun that children have growing up. So um, this is something came out of the hearts of people that we need this. Let's band together and do it, uh, in in a way, out of love for one another. And we're not going to turn to the state, although there's nothing wrong with turning to the state if they offer money for things like this with the same motive to improve life on the ground. Government can be pretty good as long as it serves and gets things going. It can be pretty mean and narrowing when it tells you what to do and when it narrows conditions and regulations so that it drives many good people out of that activity. One of the the great tragedies has been that place where love is first shared that that first experience and how that person is formed in that and that happens within the family and when the family is pulled apart or uh, undermined in in some capacity that's when that fundamental building block falls apart doesn't it oh that's exactly what got the other 13 to write rare on alarm his letter of to the world of 1891 which had a great impact around the world even the economic historians write about the impact. 
and it was a big boost to labor unions, for example, because of the intervention of the Americans. The American bishops said, don't condemn labor unions. The Pope was tempted to, because in Europe, so many of them were socialist or communist, that uh, the bishops were rather negative toward them. But not in America. Our bishops said, you know, we have not lost the working class from the church. In fact, the working class in America is the bastion of the church. They're the ones who are putting up the churches and the schools, and uh, they formed the unions of the, uh, for themselves, the Knights of Labor. And uh, so it was a great strength for the church in those years. And um, anyway, um, that's one of the effects Rare Novorum had on the world. And But the, the main reason he did it was, as you say, the family. Yeah, I don't know if you remember what Pope John Paul II said about the beginning place of love. Mm. He said that the first place, the first moment when a child begins to understand, doesn't understand, but to experience the love of God, is the look, look of her mother's eyes when she's born. The first thing she sees is her mother's eyes. And in that love is communicated this sense of the world, human existence is made of love. And it is. Um, so, you know, it, it's communicated best through family life, without words. And it goes on. They, you know, your parents parents need to correct their children and help them develop good habits and discourage bad habits. And it's tough work and tough love. But that's how you get law-abiding good people, people who are so good social animals, good political animals, who learn to think in a scope larger than the family. They want to improve society. And that's what we mean by social justice, that capacity. But it's motivated by love. Mm -hmm. It's moved by love. The energy comes from love. We'll continue our conversation with Michael Novak in our next episode. With Michael Novak, we've gone inside the pages of Social Justice Isn't What You Think It Is. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to EncounterBooks.com, the website for its publisher, Encounter Books, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this discussion along with many others, go to DiscerningHearts.com. This has been a production of DiscerningHearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.